and everyone just continued doing what was right in his own eyes. If you have your book of Ruth in front of you, please follow along with me as I read. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, in Bethlehem and Judea, and there was people there from the town of Moab and from the country of Moab, and Elimelech said to his sons, let's go, we're going to go to where the food is. And so these Hebrides left Bethlehem and Judea, and they went to Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband, died. So his sons took two wives of Moab women, one named Olga and the other named Ruth, and they lived there ten years. And both Malon and Kilian died, so that the women were left without father, without husbands, without men. Then she arose with her daughter-in-laws and said, Let us return, for I have heard while I was in the field that there is food in Bethlehem. So they set out from the place where they were, with their two daughter-in-laws, and they went to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with me, the dead, and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of your husbands. Then she kissed them and lifted up their voices, and they wept. And they said to her, No, we will not return. We will go with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that you may have husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your own way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I was to have a husband this very night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, this is exceedingly bitter for me, for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and they wept again, and over it kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Then she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods and returned with her your, with your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. When you die, where you die, I will die, and I will be buried there. May the Lord do so even worse than this if things like this keep me from doing this. And Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, and she said, no more. Then the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? And she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. And I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Now why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem just at the beginning of barley harvest. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man, a man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite and Naomi said, Let's go to the field and glean among the ears in that field, in the sight that I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the fields after the reapers and happened to be part of the field that just happened to belong to Boaz, who was the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz himself came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they answered, And the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant said, Who was in charge of the reapers, She is a Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. She came and she has worked continually from morning until now, except for one short break. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not glean in any other field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field, they are reaping, and go after them. Have I not charged young women men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from the young men have drawn then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and she said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you have left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people you did not know. The Lord repay you for what you have done. A full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your very own servants. 
And in the meantime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed her oats and rice and gravy. And she ate until she was completely satisfied. And then she had some left over and she rose and cleaned and Boaz instructed his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles from which you can leave for her to glean and do not rebuke her. Since she has gleaned in the fields until evening, and then beat out what she had gleaned, and then took about an ethath of, gar of barley, and she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned, and she brought it out and gave her the food that she had left over from the eating and being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she took her mother-in-law in, whom she had worked, and she said, The man whom I have worked for today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Because he said to me, You shall keep close to my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you should go with the young women, lest in any field you would be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat fields seasons. And she was with her mother-in-law. Then Naomi said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well for you? It is not Boaz, our relative, with whom young women you were? When it is winning barley threshing, and threshing tonight, Wash therefore and anoint yourself, and put on the cloak, and go to the threshing floor. And do not make yourself known to the man until he had finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down there, and wait until he tells you to do. And she replied, What shall I say? She went down to the threshing, and she said, I will do whatever you said. And then she did. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and had his heart merry, he went and laid down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. And at midnight the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made kindness, this last kindness, even greater than your first kindness, that you have gone out and could have had any of the young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do what you have asked, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer even nearer than I am. Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he will not redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until morning. So she lay down until the morning, and she rose before anyone could recognize her. And he said, Let it not be known among the women who came threshing the floor, and bring the garment you were wearing, and was about. And she held it out, and he measured out six measures of barley, and put it on her. And then she went into the city. And after she came to her mother, I said, How did it fare, my daughter? Then she said all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until now the matter turns out. Wait and see how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest until he sees how the matter goes today. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat there. And behold, the Redeemer of Boaz had spoken of came by. And so Boaz said, Turn aside, my friend, and sit down. And he turned aside and he sat down. And then he took ten men of the elders and they sat at the city and they said, Sit down here. So they sat down and they said to him, the Redeemer, Naomi has come back from the country of Moab and is selling a parcel of land that belongs to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it this day and say, buy it in the presence of these sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem the land, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know. For there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I will come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, And the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in the inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it then for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now there was a custom in the former times in Israel concerning the redeeming of an exchanging to confirm a transaction. 
The one drew off the sandal and gave it to the other. And this was a manner of attesting in Israel. So the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. He drew off the sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders of all the people, you today are my witnesses. And today that I have bought the hand of Naomi and all that belongs to Elimelech and all that belongs to Kilion and all that belongs to Malon. Also, Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead and his inheritance. And the name of the dead may not be cut off among his brothers in the gates of the native places. You today are my witnesses. Then all the people who were gathered at the gate and all said, We witness. May the Lord make the women who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthy in Epaphra and be known in all Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, who Tamar brought to Judah because of her offspring that the Lord had given amongst the young women. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And this may be his name, renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life, a nourisher of your old age, and your daughter-in-law who loves you, who has more than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid, her on, laid him on his lap and nursed him. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a nickname, saying, He shall be the son of Naomi. And they named him Obed, and the father of Jesse, and the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amenabad. Amenabad fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. And Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse became the father of the king of kings on the earth. And his name was David. And 
so you would think if he were going to share that inheritance, if he was going to redeem us who disdain him, then he would, it could impair his inheritance. His inheritance. He could maybe lose out. And I think of um, in Philippians 2 where it says, Jesus Christ did not uh, consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself without, it doesn't say this, I'm adding this to here, but without fear of losing his inheritance. He did not think that, oh, wow, if I, if I save those people, if I redeem those people, this is going to throw the whole concept of me inheriting from God the Father everything. So he went out and he did that. He, didn't, he wasn't concerned. And you can think about uh, Boaz a little bit. Boaz said, I can do it. I can go ahead and do it. But uh, Boaz is, is a shortcomer too, isn't he? he He's not Jesus Christ either, uh, because he, he said he could do it because it would not impair his, his inheritance, um, which means he at least gave it some thought. Uh, he was, a, I think as far as we know, he was a bachelor, and he had no other children. And we can wonder about Boaz. If he did have children, he may have said the same thing that the Mr. X said, and said, well, I can't do it either. So, so we don't want to elevate a Boaz or an Obed and say, oh my goodness, weren't they great? We want to say, oh my goodness, these were types and they remind me of Jesus Christ, whom we will elevate. So let's look at a couple of verses here. Uh, you can jot these down uh, and look at them later. I don't, I don't know that we'll have time to look them all up. Romans 8.17 uh, talks about that God's children are his heirs, fellow heirs with Christ, if we suffer with Christ. So it, it has really struck home with me. You are, and so I'm just trying to remind you, if you're in Christ, you are a fellow heir. You've been redeemed, not just saved, but redeemed and have, a, have an inheritance that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, in Galatians 3.29, uh, we are told that we are Christ, if we are Christ, then we are Abraham's offspring. And if we're Abraham's offspring, then we are heirs according to the promise. So we read lineage in Old Testament and in the Gospels, we read the lineage of Jesus Christ. But consider your spiritual lineage. Your spiritual lineage traces you through Abraham uh, all the way back through uh, uh, all these Old Testament people. Go, oh, I'm in there. Uh, I have been redeemed. In Acts uh, chapter 20, verse 32, this is when Paul is talking to the elders of Ephesus, and he talks about that they have, they have an inheritance from God, and the word, the word of his grace, and it builds you up with those being sanctified. And so we start to see that our inheritance is not because it was done at the city gate. Your inheritance was done by the word of God. It was spoken, your inheritance was spoken into existence no different than let there be light in Genesis 1. In Galatians 4, 7, it says that we are no longer a slave, right? If you want to tie it in with Ruth, you're no longer a Moabite. No longer a slave, but a son, and therefore an heir, because God had sent his baby son to that's in verse 4, where it talks about uh, at just the right time, God had sent his son into the world. And so this idea of redemption, one thing it does have, have in common is little baby Obed was, was a redeemer. And we're getting into the Christmas season. Little baby Jesus is a redeemer. In Ephesians 3, 6, this is good news for us because I don't know if anyone here is Jewish. But in Ephesians 3, 6, it says that the Gentiles... All our fellow heirs, just like the Moabites, you have in. So, if you're wondering about the Old Testament, oh, that was just for the Jews. Uh, think about the Moabites. And think about the Ninevites. These are non-Jewish people that God was redeeming. He always had a global uh, mindset. Uh, two more, and we're, and then I'll turn it back over to Pastor Ray. Titus three seven. Titus 3, 7 says, justified by his grace to become heirs according to hope of eternal life. It is by his grace that you have this inheritance in Christ. And then the last one, I actually want to, I hear some pages turning back there, but maybe I'll hear more now. Go ahead and turn to 1 Peter, and, we'll, and I'll end with this one. 1 Peter chapter 1, and in 1 Peter chapter 1, in uh, in uh, verse, I'll just start at verse 3 but, and just go through verse 4, but it will end in the middle of a sentence, so you should maybe read that later. Starting in verse 3, 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father.
Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is three things, imperishable, I'm sorry, four things, imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Those four things, if you need me to uh, point them out to you, uh, this inheritance is imperishable. It will not die. It is undefiled. That means it's incorrupted. It, it, is, uh, it, it is pure. It is, there's no loopholes in it or anything like that. Well, what about this and what about, you know, point G, uh, little letter I, you know, there's a little footnote there that maybe says you're not qualified for this inheritance. And then it says it's unfading. This is my favorite of the four, or one of my favorites, because it, the word is talking about it, it is in contrast to flowers, right? Beautiful flowers in a vase, they are in the process of fading but not your inheritance. It is not like the flowers, which if you want to contrast flowers with something else, in the Old Testament it says, uh, flowers fade and fall, but the word of the Lord lasts forever. That's why your inheritance is secure, because it's by his word. And then the last one, it says it's kept in heaven for you. It is a kept inheritance. It's in heaven. It is not subject to the whims of my own existence. It is kept in heaven for you. And I just thought of this this morning. And I thought of many times we will go into a self-defense mode. Has anybody ever been accused or something like that? And you go into self-defense and you start justifying yourself. And I thought of this this morning is, is that if you have a redeemer, if, if you think you can defend yourself, then what in the world do you need Jesus Christ for? And the answer is, He's your redeemer. He's your defender. You do not need to defend yourself. You do not need to justify yourself or redeem yourself. In fact, you cannot. Thank the Lord that he has sent a justifier and a redeemer. Pastor Rick. Thank you. I know the clicker is somewhere. Oh, here it is. said to me, I've never saw that in the book of Ruth before. I've had a lot of people say, I'm learning some things, and let me just tell you, it is just the tip of the goodness of this entire book. In order to be a goel, a goel is the Hebrew word for redeemer. First of all, he must meet certain qualifications. He must be a blood relative. In order to be a goel, uh, Jesus could not become the ultimate goel without having flesh and blood. And so let me just read from, as, as Pastor Darrell, we did not talk about which verses we were going to use. But in Galatians chapter 4, it says, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son. And the reason why he had to send forth his Son, because he could not buy us back if he was not a blood relative with us. And so from the very beginning, even before he said, let there be light, he had already joined the human race by birth in his spirit and then became the Goel before anyone ever went wrong in, in Genesis chapter 2, or 3. He says he must also be able to redeem. And we find in 1 Peter, and I'm going to go ahead and pick it up in verses 18 and 19. Knowing that you were ransomed from this feudal inheritance, you have now an inheritance that is not perishable, such as gold and silver are but with precious blood, the blood of Jesus, which is imperishable. And so he is able to redeem because he didn't become Jesus one night in Bethlehem. He is Jesus and always has been Jesus and always will be Jesus. He is the only one able to redeem. It says that he must be free to redeem. And how many of us can remember some of those great passages out of Hebrews in chapter 7, verse 26, where it says, it is indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. Why? Because he's holy, innocent, unstained. He is not fading away. He is separate from, but related to sinners, and he is exalted above all heaven. He is free to redeem. He did not need anyone to redeem him. He is the only one who is free to fully redeem, and he must be willing. 
You know, Jesus did not come to earth reluctantly. And you say, oh, do I have to go? Anybody ever get up on Sunday and say, come on, we're going to church. And you hear somebody say, oh, do I have to go? Couldn't we just, wouldn't it be good? Jesus wanted to. In Matthew chapter 11, he says this, come to me, all you who are laden and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isn't that what Naomi kept wanting for her daughter-in-law? For rest. And that word there for rest means security and stability. Don't forget that. He says, come and I will give you security and stability forever. Temporarily, as long as you live on earth. Eternally, as long as I live in heaven. I can be your eternal rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Learn my ways. For I am gentle and lonely in heart. And you will find not just rest for your days, but rest for your soul. You know, it is one thing to be tired. It is another thing to be confused. And then when we're tired and we're confused, it is a greater thing to know that nothing ever tires or confuses the Lord. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Today we want to sew up the book of Ruth. So it's Ruth in review. And so today we're going to talk about some last-minute truths from Ruth, and I said they ought to be tea roots. In other words, as some of you have already pointed out, did you know that if you put the T in front of the book of Ruth, you get the word tea roots? And so today, let me give us some tea roots to close with. Tea root number one. Find out the truth before you make your decisions. Because remember, it is direction, not good intentions, that determine your destination. Find out the tea roots before you say yes or no. The next one goes like this. Pray to discover what the tea roots are after a bad decision. So find out what the tea roots are. If you find yourself saying things are not going right, things are consistently going wrong, if you find yourself living in Moab and finding out you never should have gone there in the first place, but while you're working in the fields, they say, hey, there is food in Bethlehem. Find out what the tea roots are after a poor decision. How many of us after a poor decision just quit? That's when we have to pick it up and carry on. Pray as you respond to the tea roots and seek to repay and repair any and all damages, directions, and destinations. Remember when Jesus looked at a man and said, truly, salvation has come into this household today. He was a wee little man. Anybody remember what his name is? His name is Zacchaeus. And he said, if I have done anything wrong to anybody, today I will pay it back twofold. In other words, once you find out what the T roots are, we have a responsibility and obligation to seek to be right with all men as much as it depends upon us. Isn't that what the Bible says? As much as it depends upon you, seek to be right and live in, in peace with all people. And so once you know what the T roots are, we should have a desire to seek to repair any and all damages, directions and destinations. I caused on my poor decision making in the past. Pray as you return to the tea roots of his word. And hear me, no tea root can be a tea root if it's not based on his word. In order for it to be the truth, and as we read in, in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, you shall know the tree root, and the tea root shall do what? Set you free. And there is no other way to be set free. You cannot be redeemed without the truth of God, and the truth of God is Jesus Christ. Pray as you honor his tea roots in everyday living. What did Naomi and, and Ruth do when they got back to Bethlehem? They just said, all right, this is the best thing that we can do. Let's go do the best thing we can do and be in obedience to what God's word says every day. Not looking for some big thing to do, but just being systematically obedient in little things because it has been said, that if you are faithful in little things, God has a way to make it available for you to be faithful also in greater things. Now that word there for much does not mean surplus. It means more important things, kingdom building things. If we want to be involved in, in kingdom building things, we need to get involved in small kingdom building activities first of all. Pray with thankfulness. How many of us are really thankful going into Thanksgiving season? How many of us are saying, I'll be thankful after all those boxes are packing out of here. I'll be thankful after the Thanksgiving dinner is cooked and served and the dishes are washed. I'll be thankful, and how many of us are saying, I'll be thankful after the event is over. But how many of us are praying in advance that I will be thankful and diligent in the work yet to do? Be thankful for the one and only Goel, the one and only Redeemer. 
Jesus Christ, who redeemed you by faith. But you would say, but what if I'm here today by way of YouTube? Or I'm here today and I'm not saved yet. Pray that today the T. Ruth will set you free. God knows those who are going to be saved. And every single person who is going to be saved will be saved by the truth of Jesus Christ being your Redeemer. There is no other person under heaven given among men whereby we can be saved. And if you're here today and you don't know if you're saved, you don't know if your name has been written in the palm of his hand, engraved in his hand, today is the day that you need to ask God, am I one of your elect? No one else could. No one else can. Praise God for the T. Ruth. And the T. Ruth's name is Jesus Christ. And if you would say it in English, we would say the Redeemer. If we were to say it in Hebrew, we would say, Yahshua HaMashiach Goen. Because we're discovering that Jesus' name is written in the entire Old Testament. It may look like the name Boaz, it may look like the name Obed, but they are just different names for the bigger picture of the entire Old Testament. And his name is Jesus. See you next week in the book. Father, as we come to an end of this series, help us to realize that this is going to be picked up where the baby is born. A son has been given. That there was joy in the midst of a very difficult time, a census. The time when people were displaced and, and out of their house and away from their norm. And so, Lord, I would just pray as we make this transition of looking at a type of Christ to looking at the baby boy of Bethlehem. Not just the nickname Obed, but the name of names, Jesus Messiah. May we have power in our living today, not because of the power that we intrinsically get from just being alive, but the power that we spiritually get from being alive in Christ. So today may we be vital in our spirit. May we be confident in your son. And may we know that uh, regardless of what may or may not be uh, blessing us here on earth, we have an inheritance in heaven, incorruptible, unfatable, undeniable, and kept eternal. Hallelujah. What a Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. See you in Bible study in a few minutes.